The third consecutive week of season 13 finally brought forth the internet era's most talked about skateboarding industry figure and 17 Sips star and director Steve Barra. Slap wasted no time in making sure to anonymously pulverize Barra for his horizontally striped long sleeve wardrobe choice, and Steve's season 13 debut appearance marks the 104th time he's read the ever evolving rules that even he criticizes. Each skater gets one challenge flag, which you're kind of a dick if you use it, Bruh. in my opinion. And and for those conspiracy theory rabbit hole spelunkers who seek further evidence that Barra, Peterson, and the Kariuma triumvirate are in cahoots for manipulating this year's championship results, take note of both Steve and Tyler reading from the same script. Let's keep it clean. Let's keep it lean. This is Battle Barracks 13. And oh, that rhymes this year. Let's keep it clean. Let's keep it lean. This is Battle Barracks 13. It rhymes this year. Oh, that it rhymes, rhymes this, this year. year. <laughs> Along with the completion of week three, we're also done with six battles so far, leaving three round one battles remaining on the left side of the bracket and seven on the right side. So if the barracks continues its two battle upload schedule every weekend, the 10 pre-recorded round one battles will be dispersed publicly over the next five weeks. Following that timeline, round two battles will hopefully begin to arrive on the weekend of August 26th and 27th. And with finals night announced for November 11th, it could mean that the barracks will taper their upload frequency down to one match per weekend in the later stages of the season 13 bracket. Nick Holt and Gustavo Ribeiro's battle sits as the most difficult battle to win in season 13 so far at 73%, leading the second most difficult battle of season 13 between Cole and Suchu by over a full percent. This means that the tricks landed in Nick and Gustavo's battle are comparatively the least successful historically in the tournament on average, and examples like the Nolly frontside inward heel flip, a trick that's been attempted 42 times but only landed 11 times, and the fact that it's only been landed once on defense by Cody Cepeda in Season 7 makes it even more lethal. Nolly frontside inward heel flips have ended six different battles as well. First in Season 6, Round 3 when Shane beat Costin, twice in Season 8, first when Cody Cepeda beat Mike Piwawar in Round 1, then in Round 3 when Asta beat PJ, once again in Season 10 when Shane beat Ishad in Round 2, and twice in Season 12, first when Nick Holt beat Chris Pierre in Round 1, and late in the tournament when Tyler Peterson beat Seva in the finals. It can be argued that the Nolly frontside inward heel flip is in a close competition with the double heel flip as the number one hardest trick ever to appear in battle at the barracks. In this case, because of the offense to defense success rate disparity. Believe it or not, double heel flips have a 93% success rate on offense, with 13 total makes out of 14, and holds the title as the first ever official death blow when Joey Brzezinski beat Chad Tim Tim in Season 1. But Tyler Peterson's successful attempt in the Season 12 championship currently makes him the only successful defender from the 15 times skaters have tried to land it defensively, making double heel flips less than 7% successful on defense. Nolly frontside Inward heel flips have a relatively lower offensive success rate than double heels, but the defensive success rate of 4.5% is over 2% lower than double heel flips, and it's worth mentioning that Nolly frontside inwards have a more diverse portfolio of skaters who've landed it on offense, with 7 unique competitors rolling away on offense while double heels only have 4 unique contestants landing the trick. For whatever reason, the action of popping Nolly, turning frontside 180, and adding an inward heel flip to the mix has historically stumped more unique skaters on defense than any other trick, while simultaneously having the most unique skaters able to land it on offense. And Nick Holt, Tyler Peterson, and Cody Cepeda are the only skaters in Season 13 who have any successful experience with Nolly frontside inward heel flips. As it stands, a cheat sheet that statistically more or less guarantees you a win in a game of skate based on a combination of largest disparity between high offensive success rates versus low defensive success rates, along with at least five or more unique skaters landing the said trick on offense, you would be wise to do switch backside 360s, backside double flips, switch laser flips, pressure heel flips, backside pressure flips, nollie back three kick flips, tray double flips, five shoves, switch double heels, and of course, the nollie frontside inward heel flip. Switching gears here, even after reviewing Karyuma team rider Gustavo's offensive five shove, it's hard to tell from the given camera angle whether or not his front heel touched upon landing. 
And it is suspicious that we didn't get a second angle that would have laid to rest any doubts about the heel touch, even though it's obvious a second angle is used throughout the battle's entirety. Holt will be progressing to round two, facing the winner of Andy Anderson versus Tori, the latter of whom I'm predicting to win. Tori's last appearance in Battle at the Barracks 12 was a win over Malto, but an injury kept him from continuing his progression throughout the tournament. And at first I predicted a hypothetical match between Tori and Nick would find Pudwell moving on, but after remembering Holt's last loss was against Tyler Peterson late in Season 12, and his subtle three-letter margin of victory over Gustavo gives me second thoughts about Nick Holt. Not to mention, Nick's current ELO score of over 1,200 is the fifth highest of any skater in the bracket, trailing only Luan, Seva, Jamie, and Tyler. This means it's very possible we'll be looking at a round three battle between Nick Holt against either Cody Cepeda or Chris Cole. One aspect of Battle at the Barracks that's hard if not impossible to tangibly implement via objective analysis is how many shits you give about your performance. And out of all six Season 13 battles so far, the biggest difference in the two competitors' level of caring about winning is most palpable in the match between Patrick Promen and Tyler Peterson. Peterson's notoriety in skateboarding is almost exclusively from his affiliation with the Barracks and his success in the flat ground realm. Whereas Promen is kind of the complete opposite, recently going pro for a core-friendly brand and making his presence known in the community through the more traditional route of filming skate parts. Not that Tyler and Patrick's battle was bad per se, but even the Deathblow teaser edit before their battle showed Peterson doing a relatively much more difficult Nolly back three kickflip versus Promen's switch inward heel. Nolly backside 360 kickflips are on that aforementioned cheat sheet list of tricks that will essentially guarantee you give your opponent a letter. With the maneuver being nearly 71.5% successful offensively, but less than 19% successful defensively. And only three successful makes have been documented on defense. First when Dennis Buznitz landed it in Season 2 Round 2, again in Season 5 Round 2 when P-Rod landed it, and most recently when TJ Rogers landed it in Paris in Season 12 Round 1. But other than those three instances, the Nolly back three kickflip has failed 13 times in the past even ending three battles, first in Season 3 Round 1 when Cesar Fernandez lost to Benny Fairfax, and twice in Season 12, both times from Tyler Peterson, first on Ray Corey, and later on Nick Holt. Promen's switch inward heel is roughly the same difficulty on offense compared to Nolly backside 360 kickflips at 71%, but they're statistically twice as easy on defense at over 41% successful, with 21 defensive makes on record. To be fair, switch inward heel flips have ended more battles than the Nolly backside 360 kickflip at 5 total, first in season 4 round 2 when Buznitz lost to Costin, again in that same season when Luan lost to PJ, once in season 8 round 1 when Trent McClung lost to Chaz Ortiz, and twice in season 12 when Nigel lost to P-Rod. Then most recently when Kelly Hart got his ass handed to him by Nick Tucker. But even if you want to argue the lethality of a switch inward versus Nolly backside 360 kickflip, Promen's body language after Tyler landed the forward flip should tell you all you need to know about how quickly Patrick wanted this battle to be over, evidenced by the action of flipping your palm upward in a quick manner, signifying the verbal response equivalent of, are you serious right now? And he flips his hand upward twice for that matter before the attempt, and one once more after missing the forward flip for a total of three upward hand twists. Tyler's alternative fakie double flip death blow is historically almost 90% successful on offense and 56% successful on defense, with 26 successful makes defensively out of 46. And Promen is now the second skater to lose on a fakie double flip, with Trevor McClung's loss to Luan in Season 8 Round 1 being the first instance. With Nick and Tyler advancing as planned, it's worth mentioning that the future of the bracket, in terms of strictly comparing ELO scores, looks like some interesting battles are ahead. Tyler's win means he will face either Malto or Mason in round two. Malto has one of the lowest ELO scores of any experienced contender in the bracket, even lower than his round one competitor, Mason Silva, who almost made it past season nine's bronze medal winner, Yunus Amrani. And Malto's win-loss record is three wins and seven losses, with his last win coming 
from a statistically easy match against Goof Off Costin in Season 11. Nick Holt's hefty 1255 ELO will be tough for Tori to contend with, assuming it is Podwell who will move on from a circus-friendly Andy Anderson. But apart from that, at this point there's just too many leaks and spoilers floating around to proceed with making any more predictions. And this is one of Battle at the Barracks' biggest weaknesses as far as the pre-recorded nature of every battle outside of Finals Night is concerned. Obviously when battles are recorded and then released at a later date, instead of live streamed like most sporting events, including SLS and virtually every other skateboarding competition, Barra and the event sponsors will have wiggle room to manipulate the narrative of every battle leading up to the final four contestants. Back in season four, there was some alleged drama surrounding Alex Mizorov's battle against Morgan Smith, suggesting Morgan's death blow was re-recorded for a cleaner attempt to justify him beating Mizorov, who had to catch a flight back to his home country regardless of the battle's outcome, and rumors hint that having Morgan advance over Mizorov would make for a smoother progression of the tournament. Not that this detail of re-recording a trick ruins season four by any means because Morgan went on to skunk PJ in front of a massive live audience, but it's an unavoidable aspect of these pre-recorded battles that beg the question of whether or not it would be wiser for the barracks to follow the Netflix meta and just dump all the round one battles at one time to cut down on trying to keep the results of completed battles hush-hush. In addition to the pre-recorded nature of the battles, this tournament suffers from the previously mentioned will-to-win aspect that we've all witnessed in Promen versus Tyler. Every NFL team in the beginning of each season aspires to find themselves performing well in the postseason, if not setting the goal of winning a Super Bowl. In a similarly objective type competition like Battle at the Barracks, we are still seeing firsthand that Patrick couldn't get out of the tournament fast enough after he witnessed Tyler's cutthroat approach to their game. I didn't know the outcome of this game already. So I don't read this part. We all know Leo Romero and Curran Caples are basically guaranteed to be out in round one, let alone even be considered as contenders for a spot in finals night. So why not find dudes who will do their best to kick some flat ground ass? It's understandable that the America pairing of Hoban versus Romero and FA pairing of Louie and Curran bodes well for scheduling battles, but why is Spencer Barton missing from the tournament? When he was one of the most competitive skaters last season and is even uploading edits of how hard he's been working on flat ground and willingly rocked the Umas in his battles. It's tough, it, you know, it's tough to find that perfect balance between a fun and competitive game of skate without sacrificing one for the other, but I'm sick of having to repeat myself about the tournament's absence of Instagram's veteran double flip hucker and only skater in recorded history to ever beat Jamie Griffin in a game of skate. Uh, speaking of dumb data though, he came through. That was great, I love the analysis. Just get him on the show sometime like for an Dumb data jo join our discord and we'll we'll, we'll we'll get on a phone call with you man <laughs> no, he, dude he skates and everything i've seen know, posting dude. clips <laughs> no he he doesn't skate does he <laughs> hold up <laughs> no he he doesn't skate does he he doesn't skate does he, he? Doesn't he doesn't skate, skate does, he? does he you strike me as a wild duck i'm a wild duck <laughs> <laughs>